So we've taken Dion's course and we've taken the Lumberjacks course. We've taken Casey's Brick by Brick Wealth course. Um, and they all invest a little bit differently. I think for us so far, um, we did get a lot out of the Lumberjack course. Most of what we were able to learn about was uh, property management. Uh, throughout his boot camp, he he brought in a few of his professional um, support team, uh, his agent, his attorney, uh, another property manager, things like that. So there was a lot of great value in those meetings. Um, his boot camps typically would last about three to four hours on uh, any given day uh, when you purchase. So you got to purchase the course and then you purchase the boot camp and you get 12 of those boot camp sessions with with Matt. And I and that's super valuable. I think uh Coach Carson is probably a little bit more towards Dion style, you know. Um the most the most uh return with the least amount of units, that kind of thing. And and again with Zuber, the same kind of thing. Um we Matt really dives into a lot of different things. Uh, like he'll tell you, you know, he, he, when he has free time, he'll just go sit in court and listen to court cases, uh, eviction cases specifically, so that he could learn the best way to win his, um, you know, win when he went in uh, on an eviction, different things like that. And Dion's a little more general, but I, I can never just wrap my head around how knowledgeable these guys are. And I know, you know, Dion probably is the newest out of the, that group being in about 12 years, Matt having 20 years under his belt and Zuber having 20 plus years. Um, so it, it depends on, I think, which way you're leaning. You know, if you're thinking you're going to gear up and go for a lot of units the way he has. Um, then yeah, play off. But I mean, learning to it just, I mean, one and listening to both of them, um, that I, so coach Carson, the way his style, I guess is the best way to say it is definitely resonates with me like mm -hmm. Dion's does. Cause Dion has a particular style that definitely resonates with me. Um, and, and I'm not saying Matt doesn't, um, but I also understand that, again, somebody just uh, sent me a text in the group here that coaches stuff is a little bit geared towards people that are already in the investing game a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. But, and, you know, it's uh, yeah. I, and I, again, I knew you had taken Matt's course. I know his um, his uh, boot camp starting up, I think, next month, September, right? I think that the last I heard, that's what he was planning. And then he also had said he wasn't sure how many more he's going to do. So yeah, that's another thing to consider. Okay. That's a, uh, that kind of helps. I mean, I, I'm probably going to pull the pin. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. What I was, that. what I was thinking too, as far as coach Carson, I mean, he, he, his strategy is a little bit different, right. With students working with students and that kind of thing, student housing and all that. So, and I think he still self manages, right? Uh, if I remember right, I believe so. Yeah. So uh, the other thing that could affect your decision would be if you're going to invest locally to your market, or if you're going to be, you know, out of state. Um, even Dion says, you know, if he if he had started out of state, he would have gone with property management versus trying to manage on his own. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I think that uh, um, that answers my question. Then my next question. Well, I have two other questions for you, real quick. Yeah. Um, one is that you already purchased your tickets for Zuber's event. Yeah, we picked ours up the day they went on sale. Car and then, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. And then the second question. I know you would. Uh, 
I saw any, some, something that you had, I think it was on Facebook with uh, Matt, the mortgage guy about um, maybe picking up one of his properties that he had for sale, uh, multifamily. I don't know if it was a duplex or what can you, are you able to share what transpired with that? Oh yeah. We, I checked in with him for a little bit more information. And to me, the, the price to rent ratio didn't make sense. I know the area that the that is duplex is in. It's in um, what I guess we would call Northern California, and it was a really nice building, but the the rents were a little bit low for when I did my analysis, and that that's all that real. That's as far as I really got with it. Okay, no, that was I was didn't know if you went with anything, and I just had seen that, and I was just curious. So, cool. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. Thanks you guys for jumping in. Uh, there's a couple new folks, uh, before we get started with Brian, does anybody else have a quick question or maybe Lindsay, if you don't mind introducing yourself and letting us know where you're, where you're at and what type of investing you're into. Hi everybody. My name is Lindsay. I don't know if I interrupted anybody. <laughs> I'm trying to. No, no, go ahead. Welcome. Hi, it's my first time joining the Cantabri group, but it's also um, the first week I belong to the school. So <laughs> I was Great. just trying to see how everybody else is doing. I invest, I live in California and I invest long distance uh, in Indiana, kind of like following the steps of Mike, Millennial Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, so I invest heavily in Gary. And yeah. How long have you been at it? Two years now. I have six homes. Uh, three of them are currently rented and three of them are in rehab. Okay. Awesome. Glad you can make it. Thank you. Um, and just so you know, I, we're fairly informal, you know, each week. Well, recently we we're trying to get some of the people that have helped Cynthia and I on our journey. And tonight, Brian Bilstein's with us. He's um, we've been working with him. He's with neighborhood loans and he's going to talk for a little bit here and let us know about his company and what they do and where they're at. And, um, we sent him uh, some questions, but if you guys come up with any questions throughout the meeting, feel free to, um, to let us know and, and get your questions answered if possible. Um, So I think with that, and then after Brian's finished and after the Q&A session, uh, we'll usually just go free form after that and talk about some things that anybody's going through this week, uh, any progress that they've made and things like that. Um, and I'm not sure, Lindsay, if you've heard, we go a long time sometimes, so you don't have to stay for the full time. We get to go into three and four hours. So um you you said you're in California. What part of California? Yes, I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. I own my primary residence here. Okay. That's not a rental. Cynthia and I are up here by Santa Cruz. Nice. I've been there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It's spoiling. It's spoiling us. The weather's been great. Um, okay. Um, so everybody, I think you you were all here last week when we were talking about having Brian on. Um, he's been a great help to Cynthia and I and I know he's working with a few of you others. Um, Mikey has checked in with Brian. Chester's working with Brian. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else is right now, but um, Brian, maybe you could just start by letting us know where you're at, what states you're licensed in and things like that. And then we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So yeah, nice to meet y'all. Brian Bielsen, I'm with uh, Neighborhood Loans. <clears throat> uh, I'm out of St. Louis, Missouri. That is where I'm at. We're licensed in... Most states, we're not in New York, we're not in a couple others up north, north uh, in the Northeast, and then Hawaii, but we're everywhere else. We're, we're in 40, I believe it's 46 states. So we're in, we're in most of them. Um, we, uh, I guess a little bit about me, I've been doing this for about 12 years. Um, you know, I grew up in St. Louis, uh, married now for 15, uh, 16, I guess, with four little ones running around. Um, 
two and a half up to 15. So, but the, uh, the investment arena has been, been a really fun one. Neighborhood loans, the team that I, that I joined over here specifically, um, we have a, a big focus on the investment side of things. So we're definitely investment friendly um, and um, mortgage company. Um, makes up, I guess, probably 65% of our business out of this branch specifically uh, between uh, myself and Greg. Greg's who I came over to learn from specifically on that side. But um, a few questions, I guess, going over the questions uh, that Frank had sent me. Did you guys have some good ones on here. <clears throat> he was asking the difference between a pre-approval, a pre-qualified letter, and pre-underwritten. Pre-underwritten and pre-approval -pre are pretty close to the same thing. Not quite. A pre-qualification letter really just means that you've you've filled out the application, they pulled your credit, and everything looks good, according to that. So there's some, some information missing then, right? A pre-approval means that you've sent in all your income documents, your assets, everything. We pulled credit, we reviewed your assets, and we re reviewed your income. And that's, that's uh, more of a pre-approval. And once you get to that point, depending on the company you're with, sometimes that you get fully underwritten with that, and sometimes you don't. It's, it heads up to your operations manager, and they'll they'll overlook everything. If there's things that we're really like concerned about, then we'll get it fully underwritten. Or if the market dictates that it's that, you know, things are that tight and we're we're looking at, then we'll get a fully underwritten file for you. Um, and that means the underwriters checked off on your uh everything except for the appraisal and title for the most part so that's the only thing those are the only remaining things um <clears throat> but if you if you're working with a, a good lender that just make sure that you're i mean that's asking for all your asset documentation and asking for updated items as you move along you don't always have to get fully underwritten prior to buying something you know as long as you know they're they're very familiar with with the investment side of things does that anybody have any questions on that I do if nobody else does. Um, or maybe yeah, question comment, I guess. So pre-approval sounds like you're right on the doorstep of getting your things submitted to the underwriter. Right. And I think that's been, I guess, the most frustrating part of this whole lending journey for us. Um and then um, because I think with you, we were, I think we were to the point of being pre-underwritten. Mm -hmm. Even with that, um, your uh, one of your um, associates, Will, still had some things that he wanted to check after the fact. And it came down to the wire. It always feels like it's like the day before you're supposed to close and they're asking for something else. But I know in our case, just for information for everybody, uh, pretty much everybody here knows that we went through bankruptcy in 2010 and our primary mortgage doesn't always show up for you guys. And that was like one of the last things that Will asked for. And so through that process, um, I, I'm not, I don't recall the name of the service, but there's a service that calls me. They call our mortgage provider and, um, we get on a three-way call and they just verify that we haven't been late for, you know, the last 12 months or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then I made the mistake because I didn't think we were going to be making any offers after, you know, the few that we passed on. So I went and got a new business credit card. So that was another thing they had to verify that there was um, a zero balance on the card. Um, there was, um, uh, they brought up a few old addresses in our past and we're just verifying that we didn't have any more, any further ties to those properties, things like that. So, you know, we're, we're waiting for the documents to sign and they're still sending stuff to, to verify. So I just wanted everybody to know that and not to get too frustrated with it. Got to have some patience and it's just part of the process. Yeah, some of those things can be can be pretty annoying that if there's any like, so we have to do a credit refresh within, depending on the loan type and all that, five to 10 days of closing. So if anything comes up on there, <clears throat> then that wasn't there in the beginning of the process, then we do those, those credit updates, like when you had to jump on the phone, you have to do that. Exactly right. The 
That was a, the mortgage one was was aggravating because you did it. You had done that one once, and for some reason, something didn't work with. So most companies use Zactus, which was Credit Plus. For some reason, we couldn't get the documentation the first time. So there's there are things that pop up like that that near the end that do need, unfortunately. Usually it doesn't pop up. We're not waiting on it a day ahead of time. But uh, on that one, the mortgage thing, for some reason, didn't come back. Yeah. So you're right. There's always, and even if it is pre-underwritten, even if it's pre-underwritten, the underwriter is always going to find something. We don't always, it's not going to get always asked for up front after the underwrite's been done, just because of certain things we have to wait till we get further down the line. But yeah, there, but the, um, well, where's it going with that? But yes, those things can be frustrating. <laughs> no doubt yeah, about it. There was a bunch of little things. And I don't know um, one thing that you just reminded me of. So on our taxes, when I when we do our taxes, from the very beginning, uh, I was just like a handyman. And our CPA put us down as Contreras Maintenance. And a few years later, it went to Contreras Construction. So we had to get a letter from the CPA saying that Contreras Maintenance and Contreras Construction were the same entity mm -hmm. um, and that's come up before uh, with some of our other loans so um, but but I think that was the last thing it was like the day before we're trying to get to the CPA and get the letter and he wasn't sure how to write it and all this fun stuff so uh, it, it was still uh, a fun journey yeah hopefully hopefully not too painful <laughs> yeah and and that brings up a, a thought about so you helped us close. We just closed last Tuesday on the one and um, we made another offer today on a different property. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, since all those, those last four issues that will help us resolve in the end, now there shouldn't really be anything else that pops up for this one, right? Except right. I guess, um, depending how far out it is till we close, sometimes you've asked for like, the next month of my profit and loss, you know, updating that because a month has finished since we did the last deal and things like that. Right. Should... Yeah. So there'll be some updating of items, but for the most part, we won't need much of anything. Any of those questions, those, 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 some of those other ones that pop up, we won't have to worry about because we've already been through it. So those are answers that we already know the question or questions we already know the answers to. Okay. Great. Yep. Yeah, so your, your profit and loss, once we go past a quarter, a full quarter, then we'll need updating typically on that. If it's within a month or two, then we're usually all right. Okay. But if another full quarter's gone by, then we have to usually get that. But yeah, that's the, the fun part about underwriting. We can get you underwritten to a certain point, but even then, it's there's still going to be things they want. There always is. I've, only, I've been doing this for 12 years, I guess. There's only been probably... 20, 30 times in 12 years that I've had a file come out and the underwriter didn't ask for anything else. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. It's kind of like an auditor or uh, or an inspector for if we need to do a construction, they're there to find something to make sure it's as clean as possible. So it's annoying, but part, unfortunately part of it, we try to navigate it, right? Yeah, and I would have to say that being our, our sixth property, you know, the first time it was super aggravating because I it was the first time we'd gone through it. Mm -hmm. Now it's just like, okay, what's next? We'll just keep on doing it. So it yeah. gets easier. It gets easier over time. For sure. And the, the unfortunate part about lending is it's not going to get any, I guess the doc, things required aren't going to get any less, aren't going to uh, lower. They're always going to want more. You'd think with all the technology we have, it get easier on documents they request and stuff like that, but it, it won't. Yeah, it's only gotten worse since 2015. <laughs> so yeah. that's a good, you know, so like the next one, it kind of goes into, and, and Grant, it goes into, I guess, being more bankable is what you're asking was one of the questions mm -hmm. or a checklist, um, which you did. You made it very easy on us, Frank. I, we appreciate that. One of the things we can do to help make it, make things easier, you know, more bank, making more bankable is being really organized with your properties. So that means keeping a, keeping really good files, like keeping your closing package that you have on every loan that you've closed for your properties, um, your taxes, keep them up to date. <clears throat> we need, we're typically, if you, if you own a business, we're going to need taxes for the last two years. 
We're going to need your K ones, depending on how you struct how your struct taxes are structured. We're going to need W twos, paycheck stubs, <clears throat> filed an extension on your taxes. We're going to want to see that with your. Um, you know, if you, own, if you own a business, sometimes you pay yourself a W-2, sometimes you don't, but you're going to want to always keep that updated. Paycheck stubs, if you do pay yourself or you work for a company, update them every maybe once a month or every other month. It just makes it easier when you're having, when you're asking and ask for documentation. Um, and then organize your stuff by property, you know, for HOI, your homeowner's insurance, taxes, stuff like that. Um, avoid transferring money. That's a big, a big annoyance is it's really, you, you won't like us if we have to ask, if we have to track money through several accounts and it's because of money laundering laws and there's um, still a lot of fraud going on. So they want to make sure that your money is not from a fraudulent source is all they're doing. So we have to track it back two months. So if it's coming out of one account and it was in that other account for a month and a half and came from somewhere else, we don't have a full two month statements, we need to go back to the other account. And then if there's large deposits that are out of the ordinary in that other account, then we have to source those large deposits and it can get, they can get hairy quick. So the less you move money around, the better. You can shoot a wire over for a closing from seven different accounts if you need to. Um, so just with, that's one of the big things. One of the biggest things is avoiding transferring money. Um, when you're investing in real estate, keeping your um, money for investing in real estate separate from your other monies, but especially if you own a business, it's you can pull money from your business for the down payment, cash to close and all that. But then it just it creates more questions. And then we have to do a liquidity test on your business and we have to do a cash flow analysis. We got to do a whole bunch of things to make sure that it's not going to harm your business. And we also have to get a letter. Um, from, from your CPA stating that it will not hurt your business in any way, taking those funds from it. Uh, another thing with inspections, when you guys are, this is more for your realtors though, but when you're, when you're doing inspections and you're in the negotiation period, get that put on a separate addendum. We don't want to see those. The more stuff we show the, the underwriter, the more they're going to ask. So like, we don't want to see, and we, we don't put them in there, but if, we don't want to see uh, seller's disclosures and we don't want to see um, your inspection notice, you know, what you guys negotiated, but then on a separate addendum. So we don't have to show it to the underwriter. Um, and uh, with your statements for any of your documents and all that, no screenshots. Underwriters and our governing bodies like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, who we sell the loans to and all that, they don't like screenshots and more accept them. So we'll just have to keep asking. So, and when we ask, you know, statements, we need, unfortunately, we, even if there's 10, of, 10 pages and 10 of 10 is blank, we still need 10 of 10. So we have to have all of them. Uh, what's, yeah, I see a question on it. It says, why does it affect my credit score to be responsible and check my credit score is due? Let's see. I guess if you can explain that, can you, I guess, hop on and ask? A, I'm not quite, I apologize, not following the question on there. Are you asking why it affects your credit score for us to, when we pull it? I think that's for you, Mark. Are you there? I think he's just complaining that it sucks when they pull our credit that our scores go down. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. I don't know I if it's worth it or not. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So when we do a mortgage pull, it's typically not going to hurt your credit. It, if it does, it might hurt it up to three points is the most I've ever seen. But in the interim, when we're first starting out, <clears throat> a lot of times we'll do a soft pull. And a soft pull doesn't affect your credit at all. But once you find a property, we have to push forward with a, with a hard pull, a regular one. But more, mortgages are, are looked at differently. The only time I've really seen a mortgage pull hurt somebody's credit is if there's been a lot of activity on your credit prior to us pulling, like if you've opened up a bunch of credit cards with whatever, Bass Pro Shop and XYZ store, or if you just went shopping for a car and they pull your credit 10 times at the car dealership, 
So a little tip on that, if you do that, get pre-approved at a local, a local um, uh, credit union, bring your letter with you and tell them they have one shot to pull your credit with one bank to beat it. And then they won't pull your credit six, six seven, eight times. Um, does, does the, um, the hard pull last 90 days typically? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then let's see, does employment pay stubs, et cetera, get checked again towards? Yes. So it does. So we have to, <clears throat> if we'll do, a, um, I mean, it depends on how long the deal goes as well. If we have enough paycheck stubs in there within the last 30 days, then we typically don't need to get them again. We are going to check employment status at the end of it. So we'll do a very, we'll get your paycheck stubs in W-2, and then we'll do a verification of employment. If we can pull it through an automated system, that's great. If not, we have to get it from your company. And then um, we do have to check just to make sure you're being fully employed at the end. So that is uh, one of our processes will call up and they will verify that you're still there. So if you're planning on leaving your company and they already know about it and you're in process, then you won't, if your income is solely based off that job, you won't qualify anymore. Unless you have another one lined up, we'd rather you not do that during the process. But if you have another one lined up, we can still close. Um, there's some things that come and come with that, though. But as far as being more lendable, I think the biggest thing is being more is being really organized with your with your information. Um, that that's a big part of it. Keeping your credit, you know, keep you keeping your credit utilization below thirty percent is going to keep you with a higher credit score. So that always helps too. If you can keep your credit utilization down. Uh, yes, when you're the, the question is, is someone with only rental income still lendable? The answer is yes. So that goes into something I was going to talk about here in a little bit, but we can just answer that now or go over that now. When you're, let's say you own a handful of properties and you'll say you own four of them and three of them are on your previous year's tax returns. And one of them you purchased in September of last year. We have to go by, for the three that are on your tax return, we have to go by how your taxes were written. So we're going to look at your Schedule E. And based on how your, <clears throat> your uh, CPA wrote your taxes or did your taxes on those properties, we have a calculation that we have to go over and that we have to go through with all those. And that's how we come up with your usable income on those. So as long as there is enough, it's okay. Credit utilization uh, per account is going to affect your is going to affect your your credit score. So thirty percent per account, but the higher that goes up on all of them, that's going to affect your debt to income based on your you know how much you make versus what your your monthly obligations are. And then on that last property, that fourth one that you owned, the one that you bought in September, we go by your your lease, so your twelve year lease. So we have to go anything that's on credit, we have to or on your tax returns that was on there. We have to use your tax returns to come up with the income uh, calculation. If you've just bought it within six months or so of the last year and it's not on your taxes, we have to use your lease. We use your lease. Okay. Can you buy the rate down when refinancing an investment property? The answer is yes, you can do that. Yep, that's not a problem. And more to that with a refinance on investment properties, you're limited on your on your um, how much you can actually pull back out. If it's a single unit, you can pull up to you can go to 75% loan to value. If it's a multi-unit, you can go to 70%. That's what you capped at. I think um, real quick, Troy was asking who you are. Troy, this is Brian Bilstein. He's a lender that a few of us are working with, and he is company is uh, Neighborhood Loans, based out of St. Louis, mm -hmm. licensed in forty six states. Yep. And and Brian, if I could interrupt for a minute and um, let everyone know how we found you and why we found you was because buying properties in St. Louis at the price point we're buying them at, once our uh, down payment and everything was in. The loan amount was pretty low, 50, 60,000. And the lender that 
we had worked with up to that point only went down to a hundred thousand and and that's why we ended up um seeking someone like you out and that's been a blessing so and that you don't just do the lower end loans you obviously go the other way too um so pretty much full service for us thank you yeah no i appreciate that yeah so we go down to if the property really makes sense and you got a, you got and you're financing like forty thousand, we can still do it. Uh, the financed amount we've done them a little below that. We, those are get those get hard for us to do just because it um, tolerance cures meaning we have to cover certain char charges because it's based on percentages. But if it really makes sense, we can do that from time to time below fifty even if need be. But we go up to five million or ten million. I'm not sure exactly what the cap is. Um, so close. To So the question is, will the, the lar a large purchase on a credit card that's close to the limit, but gets paid off at the end of each billing cycle hurt your credit? It depends on your credit usage history. And then that's not the answer you want, but it, credit's such a fickle thing. You might have one person who has, uh, you know, the, all their different trade lines and they pay off. If they don't, I guess the answer is if you pay your limit, your, your card off every month, then it, it shouldn't be an issue. If you pay it off at the end of every month and you never carry a balance over, you should be good. If you don't and you pay and you feel, let's say you carry balances and you decide to pay a bunch of them off all at one time, it could hurt your credit because your credit history shows that you usually carry a small balance, whatever that is, or, a, you know, 20% or less. If you go and pay them all off, that's going to hurt your credit. In addition to that, if you just close accounts out, that's a bad thing because it lowers your available credit usage overall or credit limit overall. So if you had $80,000 worth of available credit and you paid off your cards and then shut down like $20,000 worth, and now you went to 60, that's going to hurt your credit typically. So it's kind of a, it's hard to answer those with, with definites because everybody's credit's so different. Um, mortgages on 30, on uh, 30 or mortgage on five units or more. We don't. Um, we work with uh, some different local banks around here that if it doesn't fall under our umbrella that we've known for a long time, have, have had a good relationship with that we typically will um, introduce people to. And a lot of times in those cases, some, you know, we find out sometimes after the fact that we might've worked with them on a different deal. We'll, we'll still gather all the documentation for our clients get it packaged up good. So we're essentially presenting to the banks that we work with on your behalf and putting you in a better light. And a lot of times, maybe not a better light, but we're going to, you know, bring a fully, a full package to them and uh, talk with them and then make the introduction for you. So. Does that also hurt credit because of both payment history and available credit? Um, I'm guessing in regards to like paying the loan off or paying your or closing out your your debt your yes yeah because of your credit yeah yeah your credit history if you suddenly change how you're doing your credit you know utilizing your credit and then you're lowering your available credit yeah that that's exactly right then it hurts your it can hurt your um your uh, credit score. See, I'm looking at. Yeah, the DSCR road, route, it would be um, per, you'd have to do one on each individual house. So if it's a, if it's two family, then you had another separate house, it's a four family and, and so on. You can do that. You wouldn't be able to buy them out, all five of them within the portfolio at the same time, the separate buildings, but you could do a DSCR on each of them. But so the DSCR is a, a great product, and I'll definitely touch on that here just a, a little in just a few. But it's a dynamite product, especially if debt to income is a little higher um, currently, or depending on if you own a business and how you write your taxes, DSCR can be a great product. <clears throat> a checklist of documents, I can certainly send that to um, to Frank if you want to get it out to everybody. But it's going to be it's going to be um, if we're going with like if I'm going to throw the book at you. The easiest thing is then two years, two years tax returns, 
two years W-2s, two years K-1s, um, or and two, uh, then we're also going to want your most recent two bank statements for your personal. We're going to want your uh, 30 days worth of checks, paycheck stubs for, uh, and this is one of the questions on the list if I didn't say that. 30 days worth of paycheck stubs. And that's going to be if you're paid, paid bi weekly, we want the last three. If you're paid twice a month, we just need two. If it's every week, we need five. Um, if you're a business owner, we're also going to need, as far as the bank statements go, if we have to do a, um, a cash flow analysis, we would need your last three months of your bank statements. And then we're going to need your IDs. And we're going to need your mortgage statements on any properties that you own that are mortgaged. If your taxes and insurance are wrapped into your mortgage payment, then we don't need your taxes and insurance. But if they're not, we're going to need your tax bill and we're going to need your uh, insurance, your insurance declarations page. So that was one of the questions on a checklist that we need from you. And that's your that's to start. Sometimes, just like construction, there's other things we find in there that we're going to have to ask you about. Uh, the more businesses you own or the more creative your CPA is, which we like, we like good CPAs, but the more creative they are, the more questions it generates. So we might have to come back to you a lot more in those scenarios. Um, portfolio deals, we do not offer, and that kind of goes into the other question. We don't do portfolio loans, but we do have some good connections. I had two clients here in St. Louis recently, two separate ones that were doing a, um, a home equity line of credit ac across multiple properties investment properties. And that's what they use as their bank when they're buying properties. So they can pull from and put 25% down or whatever they end up doing on each ones to acquire more. So it's, yes, you can, you can definitely portfolio loans and wish we did, but we don't, but we know some good people who do. Um, if you lock in your rate and the rates fall before you close, we get this question a lot right now. Rates are going down in, the, in a good fashion right now. They're not as aggressively that low is, is what the media might tell you, but they are moving down and we hope it, it continues on that trend. We did have a pretty good kickback over the last day and a half of rates going back up, but they're not bad. They're still lower than they were. Um, but yes, we can lower your rate still if it's been locked in. It's called a float down policy and the market has to move enough for us to be able to do it. So some companies have different policies. Typically it's 75 basis points. Your, the rates have to move down by before we can lower your rate. So if you're at whatever, 7.875, and if it moves far enough, we might be able to drop it down to like 7.75 or 7.625. It's not going to be a crazy drop, but it, we do have that option. Um, let's see. And then the other one you had was on reserves. Reserves is a really good question. As you get more properties that are financed, <clears throat> you're going to, the reserve requirement changes. So if you own, if you own um, four families or four buildings or less, you know, four uh, investment properties or less, we're going to take 2% of the aggregate unpaid principal balance on those properties minus, we don't include though, the, uh, your principal residence. Okay. If you own between five and six properties that are financed, we're going to take 4% of the aggregate unpaid principal balance. Again, not including your primary residence. And if you own seven to 10, we're gonna take 6%. We wanna see 6% of the aggregate unpaid principal balance on all those properties minus your principal residence. So we're gonna, we're gonna take your principal interest taxes and insurance. And if there is an association due for it and multiply that by 6%, and you have to have that much left in reserves after your cash to close for your down payment closing costs. And I can send you something on that too, Frank, if you guys want to see that further. But the reserve requirement basically goes up. Do you count retirement accounts in your reserve? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, we can use IRAs, we can use uh, stock accounts. We can, there's a lot of stuff we can use, definitely. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Then there's some other questions here. Um, let's see, what's your typical DSCR setup? Do you have a 30 year fixed on one to four units? If not, what's your typical? Yeah, uh, so we do uh, up to four units on that. 
Um, we can actually do 20% on a four unit building with DSCR. With Fannie and Freddie, we do always, if, if you can, it typically, it's always typically gonna be better if you can use your Fannie and Freddie slots before you move to a DSCR loan. DSCR is great, but the terms are just gonna be a little, not quite as favorable as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. So we always try and push people towards that side of it. We'll look at both to see what's gonna make the most sense, but nine out of 10 times, Fannie and Freddie are gonna be better going through a traditional loan. But we go down to 20% on one to four units, up to a four unit property with DSCR. Um, it has to be one to one on your rent to what your um, mortgage payment is. We do have an option. If your rent calculation comes back less from the appraisal, the investment side of the appraisal, uh, the rental portion, we can go down to 80% to one. So eight to one, 0.8 to one. Your terms are gonna get worse. The rate's gonna go up and the cost of the loan's gonna go up. But if that property makes sense and you're renovating it and it's gonna cash flow really good after you're done doing your work to it, then sometimes we, we do have clients that still move forward if the rent's not covering your mortgage at the time of closing. Um, let's see. Our amortization on balloons, I'm guessing that's what AM is on, on the balloons. Um, it's a 30 year amortization. Typically it's like a seven one or a seven, a seven two or like a five one or a five two, which means the rate's locked in for five years on a five two, but it, can readjust every two, every or twice a year. If it's a seven, if it's like a five one, then it's going to adjust once a year. Um, oh, thank you, Mikey. That was great talking to you the other day. I appreciate that. Let's see. Short-term rentals, we can do uh, on DSCR. That's not an issue. The calculation is a little bit different, but it, we can, we just have to, it takes a little more um, lifting on the front end to make sure that there's a good chance that the rents are going to cover. Um, that's a great question on the, uh, the geo, uh, geodesic dome. I just spoke with somebody about this recently. We do have a couple outlets for that. They get pretty finicky though. Um, so I'd have, I'd have to dig on that more for you to, to give you a real good answer on that. Let's see, do you offer DSC loan or a loan that recognizes income and property? But yeah, we can, we can definitely do short-term rentals. Can you count rent income? Uh, so if it's the rental income from a roommate, uh, short answer is no. You really, I mean, you really can't. Unfortunately, unless you live in like a, a multi uh, a multi unit, if you got four units and you live in one of them, then we can count the other the other three the other three units towards your rental income. But see what other questions we have here that Frank sent me. As far as uh, investment properties go, you cannot use gifts. Gifts are not allowed, unfortunately. There is a way around that. If it's your spouse and they're not on the loan, they have to be on title. And you can use funds from, from them in that scenario. So like if there's a situation where something happened to your, your spouse's credit and you just want to be on the loan on this one, so you get more favorable terms, you can still get the funds from them as long as they're on title. And... Uh, the money's wired directly to the title company. It can't go into your account. It's got to go directly to the title company. And that's something that changed not too long ago. Delayed financing is another thing. I don't know if you guys ever looked at, look at that much. Delayed financing would be really nice if you're in a if you're in a really fast market and you need to have a cash offer to compete. We can do delayed financing. Um, essentially, we just want to have a conversation before you do it, so we make you, sure you qualify for it on the on the backside. So you're buying a house with cash. If we do it right, then we can do a cash out refinance one day after closing, 
and we can get we can get you we can get you up to seventy percent back on that, including if we if we work it right, your uh, closing costs. We just need to have a conversation prior, so we make sure everything's titled right, and you guys have things put on the um, the Alta or your closing statement correctly in the right spots. Oh, that's awesome. That's good. Let me read down this one. That space bar didn't mess with your uh, <laughs> your message on there. About a fourplex in February second. Um, you can you can do them right away. Actually, it just depends on how how you have it structured. Um, when you first buy it. If, so there's, there's this, guy, this is going to get really into the weeds. So I don't know how far I want to get into that. If you own a primary residence, if you own your house, and you so I mean you have a you have a monthly obligation, and you purchase another your first rental property, and there's then we can offset your your whole payment on that rental property minus one dollar. So we're only hitting your monthly debt to income. So let's say your your mortgage is a thousand bucks. We're not going to hit your debt to income for a thousand bucks, meaning it's going to jump it quite a bit in that in that scenario. We're only going to hit your debt to income for one dollar. That sounds goofy, but that we don't have to. You don't. There doesn't have to be a lease on the property either. There needs to be no lease on it. If you do not own a primary residence, you don't have a primary housing expense, then we have to hit you for the full boat on all properties owned that are not on taxes. That's kind of getting into the weeds to on on that answer for you there, but you can as long as you qualify, you can buy several properties at once, um, or you can do it right after you close or during the process. We just have to make sure you have enough reserves to cover, and debt to income is good. New yeah, uh, Yes, the next one's a good question. When preparing to close on a property, does moving money around? from accounts mess anything up with the lending processor as long as the accounts are in your name doesn't matter you it makes it messy because we have to track it back two months <clears throat> for each account that it moves from until it's rested in that last account for two months or more so yeah i can it can make it messy um especially if there's large deposits that are not normal in that account um it can it can definitely muddy the waters it's as long as you're very, uh, you're very, uh, what's, you keep really good records though, and we can track it easily. It's not always the worst thing in the world, but you can wire from several accounts. It's not, it's, it doesn't, and that, so we usually ask that you don't move money around so it doesn't present an issue at the end. Is delayed financing more expensive? Um, it is a little bit. Because you're doing a refinance, so Fannie and Freddie, there's it's called loan level pricing adjustments. The rates are always going to be a little bit higher on a refinance than they are on a purchase, um, and you're going to be paying title costs again. But if you got to move fast with cash, and or there's an issue with something that we can't lend on it for at that time, but we're going to be all right a month from then when you close, it still can be a, definitely a good option. But yeah, it is going to be a little more expensive because you're paying title again. Um, Let's see. Yeah, the, the you're asking about the short-term rental. We can we can we can account short-term rental. I know there's a calculation to it, but but it's uh we can we can do it. Which <laughs> I I do have a primary and thank you. Oh, still moving money around? That's okay. <laughs> Is that what you say? You're still going to move money around? That's fine. You can. It just makes it, it can be, it can make it money, but it, but it's okay. Um, you can also uh, purchase things in a trust. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody, any of you do that, but you can, you can purchase properties in a trust. You cannot purchase properties with, through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a business name. If you're doing it with a business name, it's got to be more, it's got more of a commercial loan at that point. Different setup. Um, DSCR, again, it's, it's a great product. Typically people utilize those more if there's issues with debt to income or their business owner that has a really aggressive accountant or, um, 
you know, you get past 10 mortgage properties with Fannie and Freddie. You can, if you're a couple or, or if you're going on together, you can have, or just going into business together, you can um, put 10 Fannie properties or 10 Fannie or Freddie properties on one on the spouse and 10 on the other. So you can have 20 together then at that point. I was wondering, Brian, on the VSCRs, you know, people kind of lean into them if they have debt to income ratio issues and things like that. But it seems like if you have debt to income ratios, should you even be trying to get more loans? You know, I mean, it, it seems counterintuitive to me. No, that's a good question. I more so where we see that is it is if the answer is yes and no if it's some uh if it's more just being you know irresponsible with with you know credit and and your money and all that then it definitely you know we don't want to see that but if somebody owns a business and they're sometimes they are they're they're making a, a ton of money but they, they just write their taxes in a way that we can only use a very small portion of it because we can only use what your taxable amount is, then we can add in back things like depreciation, depletion, amortization. There's a there's a um, calculation we have, but sometimes it's just a matter of your your accountants too good maybe uh, for your company, and then we just don't have enough to use it under, under normal circumstances. If that makes sense. Transversely, I, I guess to that same note, if you you know if you don't own a company but you have several rental properties. And again, your accountant's just very creative. That might be, it might cause an issue. And um, you might need to, at that point, do a DSCR loan. Even though you might be making really good money and for all intents and purposes, you are probably in a lot of cases. It just, we get, we get hamstring if we, you know, depending on how good your accountant is. So a lot of times with that, we will talk with people's accountants prior to them filing taxes not advising them one way or the other, but showing them what we can and can't do. And maybe there's certain things they can put in one column versus another column that allow us to still qualify you for more properties. So we'll do that a lot of times. We'll book meetings with, with clients and or their, their accountant just to show them what we can and can't use if that helps them to qualify for more properties. Depends on their goals. Okay. Yeah, that was my... Um that's how I was in the past, you know, trying to get my CPA to, well, not necessarily hide stuff, but I guess kind of hide stuff. So I wouldn't have to pay too much in taxes, but after, you know, re-educating ourselves in through this process and wanting to be lendable, you know, it, it, it makes sense for us to, now the last couple of years we have paid quite a bit more in taxes than we have over the last 15 or 20. So that that's a, been a mindset shift for us too. Yeah. It's a double-edged sword. It's, and I, I get it. You know, we, when you own a business, there are a lot of advantages to be able to, you know, on how you write your taxes that can lower your tax liability. So I, I 100% understand it. It just, unfortunately is a double-edged sword that, it can really can affect things depending you know, on what you're trying to do outside of the business. Yeah, for sure. It's um, let's see, just to there's another one to expand on the question familiar about moving money. If I have a down payment amount in my cash position in fidel in a fidelity account, is it better to pay the down payment from there instead of move? Yeah, I would just leave it there. I mean, you what you have to do is you have to get make sure you get two bank statements. Or two statements from your, if you don't, let's say you move it to your bank account, you have to get two account statements from Fidelity. You have to get a transaction history from Fidelity showing the money coming out and where it's going. Then you'll get, you'll have your two bank statements from the previous months for the bank account that you transferred that money into. And you have to get a transaction history report for that account as well, showing the money going in. So it can be fully tracked. So you can do it. It just creates more paperwork. But if it's if there's not the worry of you know large deposits and other stuff sourcing issues, then then you can certainly do it. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened to us too, Dennis. We uh, we have our savings in a Barclays online savings account, and then when it was time to wire the funds, I transferred them to my personal checking and did the wire from there because I 
I couldn't figure out how to do the wire from Barclays if it's even possible. Yeah, some accounts are uh, harder to do it from than others for sure. So I, I, that is one thing I would suggest if you're transferring, depending on the account you're getting into or transferring from, call them ahead of time, like if two or three weeks out before closing and find out how long it takes for that to get initiated. Some take longer than others. Yeah, with Barclays to transfer the money to my checking, it takes, it has never taken more than two days. So usually a week before closing, I'll transfer the funds. Nice. Yeah, that's good. A lot of a lot of accounts are good about it. And I hope this hasn't been too boring tonight. The stuff that we're talking that I'm <laughs> that we're talking about can be uh, pretty dry. So I, I hope it hasn't been too terrible for uh, what we're talking about. No, I think you're with the right group. It's <laughs> 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 pretty exciting for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting, but the some of getting into the weeds sometimes <laughs> you can you can uh, see people their eyes glossing over sometimes. So but yeah. I'm, I think it's good. Been good. Yeah. And I think um like you know, you and I have talked before about products changing sometimes from week to week and something that was good this week isn't good next week. And but there always seems to be something new that comes around the corner that helps us to be able to keep moving forward as far as financing goes. And um, one thing that I was gonna mention also is the fact that sometimes out there in the forums and stuff, we hear about like comparing two or three lenders, comparing you know insurance agents and things like that. But I think it's been valuable for us to find someone like you to work with because once you once we get our history established with you, we're we're good. And if we in in six months we find another property, we just have to update, you know, like you said, pay stubs, bank accounts, maybe uh, maybe my profit and loss. So it, you don't have to go through the whole paperwork load again, you know, when you're working with a good lender. And one thing that I was um, pleasantly surprised about last week after we closed on that property, and I didn't realize that our agent had contacted you, but you were already trying to analyze our situation to see how we could move forward with another purchase. And, and that, I thought that was pretty cool. I, so I, I don't shop around personally. Uh, if we find someone that we like working with and, um, and we have, then, you know, we'll stick, we'll stick with you. I, I appreciate it. We, it's uh yeah no thank you we we kind of and I so yeah I, we, you know we do I do work with some investors that still do shop but I think a lot of times we do get first first punch at it you know first um, first go at it um, I think one of the things that I think does help set us apart is that we do it makes up a lot of what we do of our business the reason I came over to where I'm at with uh, neighborhood loans was to work with Greg Iverson out of here I don't know if any of you have heard him before but he does. He has traveled and uh, talked as well on investing. <clears throat> and I've worked with investors for the past 10 years, but not at the same capacity he has. He's um, a super neat guy. He's super down to earth. He's the number one uh, number one lender in Missouri uh, out of any company and number 12 in the U.S. So that's why I came over to Neighborhood Loans was to work with him and learn from him. So he's coaching me. And 65% of his business or better each month is, is with investors and turnkey companies. So that's, I think, been a huge part in why we've, I think, grown even more in this sector is because it's, we do so much of it. Um, and Greg invests himself. He's been involved on his own with over, in over 200 transactions um, personally on investment properties. He right now, he, I think he owns about 70 properties personally, and he still self-manages. So, you know, all this is coming from me learning and doing it over the years, but a lot of it from, from learning from Greg as my mentor and, and latching onto him and his team. And for him to be able to do the volume he does, he's got an amazing team behind him, so our operations. Um, so as we you know continue to move forward, we do have a great, you know, there's a lot of things that you, you don't know until you dig into it as hard as they do and as many as they do. I've learned several things since moving over that I can do loans now for people that I weren't, wasn't able to before. Um, because of small little tweaks in the file that are allowable by Fannie and Freddie that help you get 
help you get financed still. So. Yeah. One thing. So we, we haven't been working with you for that long, but we've done a lot of stuff. We've, we've had a lot of different um, scenarios that we've been trying to work through. One thing that you mentioned about the turnkey providers, you met one of ours in John there in uh, Illinois. And yeah. we've, in the group, we've talked before about how if you're doing a turnkey deal, usually the turnkey providers have a lender they prefer to work with because that lender knows the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and Allie was on with us a few weeks ago, but she um, she also was saying like, if you're trying to buy a turnkey and you're trying to work with a Wells Fargo or a Bank of America, the, the process is not uh, something they're familiar with and they could blow up a deal. Um, sometimes it might feel like, I don't know, it might feel kind of shady if a turnkey provider says, here, you work with this guy because that's who he, we work with. Mm -hmm. But in this case, um, the deal's going to go a lot smoother, <clears throat> like you said, and Greg has a lot of experience with that too, um, to help the deal flow and know what to expect and things like that. Um, so I, I've been really comfortable, uh, as far as that goes as well. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. It's, <clears throat> it's been great working with you as well. It's, and it's, he's, um, yeah, he's been a huge asset and I get to tie into his, his operations team. So it's been nice having that as, as a backing, you know, they're the ones who are working on all my files on the backside as well. So, but any, yeah. anybody you get, you end up working with just making sure they're a good lender and they've got, they are same as with real estate agents. You want to make sure it's someone that's investment friendly. That's does it and has a good background with it. I think is really important. And it's just building out your team then whether it's, I think it's in, you know, in your own hometown or in, in another, you know, in another city that's building out a team you can trust, I think is the biggest thing, whether it's, you know, from down to your contractors, the handyman to, dig in harder to your electrician, to your um, your flooring guy, insurance, mortgage, real estate. I mean, just all of it, making sure you've got a real good team that you guys are, you know, knows what they're doing, I think is a big thing. Yeah, that's super important. And, you know, with, um, with uh, Greg being an investor himself, hopefully, you know, you've expressed interest in it as well. Hopefully you, you'll be able to do that. But, you know, you've made connections with our agent there, Alicia. Uh, she's an investor herself. And we're we're liking the St. Louis market right now. Um, so we're trying to move forward and pick up a, uh, another unit or two. But you've also, I think, I'm not sure if you've met our insurance agent, Mark Smith. Uh, yeah. yeah. So Mark's been awesome. And, and he understands the investing game as well. And then all the way over to our property manager, you know, Nathan Cross with RPM Endeavor, he's also an investor. He and he has a partner, I think they're doing flips and stuff in the area, but he's very knowledgeable. So I think we're lucky to have landed in this spot. Yeah, yeah, we, Alicia's, Alicia's great. She's been awesome to work with. We're working on a, a few others right now. She is a really smart lady. She's yeah. not singing her praises to anybody. If there's looking in the St. Louis market, definitely contact it's Alicia, Alicia Sierra. She's dynamite. She's been doing it a long time. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited. I think I was telling you last time, but we talked before. And as uh, my wife, we, we're not investing in real estate yet. My wife, it's not something that has made her sleep good at night. And I like her more than, more than I like real estate. So <laughs> we haven't done it yet, <laughs> but she's, uh, she's excited about going to, um, uh, to learn more about real estate at the, in the, in, the, uh, in Nevada. Yeah. So, in February uh, to Vegas. Yeah. Yeah. We were super excited to hear that you, you were interested in going as well. Yeah. Um, we're really excited. So I'm, I'm excited that she's finally coming around with it and going to be happy with it. Cause I, like, again, I like her more than I do do houses. So <laughs> now that she's getting on board, I'll be able to start doing it next year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. And I think you're, you're in a, a good market for it. You could do it in your own backyard and, you know, it seems like it'd be a lot easier than the way I, uh, Cynthia and I started out from California, ending up in your area, but it, it's been good to us so far. Yeah. Um, I, I've never heard this group so quiet. 
do yeah. do any of you guys have questions or anything for Brian or anything else that's going on with you? I'm sure he doesn't mind listening to some of the other things that we get together for. For sure. No, I'd love to. Yeah. I got a question. Hi, Cody. Um, when do you do any work with like the like a 50, 40, 10, for example, like, uh, you know, having 50% for the lender, 40% from the seller, and then 10% from uh, the buyer? Or how would how would you usually set those up if you do do them? Unfortunately, we don't. Um, that's not to say that we won't down the road, but we don't right now. So I'd have to, you know, connect you with some, connect, you know, typically in that scenario would connect people with, uh, you know, another investor that we work with around town. Got it. Okay. But those can definitely be a good option. There's that is the neat thing about this world is there's so many different ways to to structure it and do it. I I had a question, but it was almost the same as Cody's, and that was if if I wanted to make an offer and include a piece of it seller financing, like say the seller is going to carry ten percent or something, will your lenders allow? Do you have products that allow that? That's almost the same as Cody's question, but. Yeah, quick answer, no. We can do like piggyback loans, mm -hmm. but I don't know that they're going to let uh, a private investor hold it. I'll double check on that and get back to you. We might have the things that's the hard thing is things are always changing. So we might have one for that, but typically the answer on a private investor is going to be no or held back seller financing. It's going to be um, a separate product that holds that that second position. So you can have your temper, you can have 10% on and it'd be covered by another entity. Does that help? Does that answer the? Yeah, I, I, I think basically it does. I mean, that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in that because that's kind of a way of making some of the higher interest rates work. If the seller will let you pay installments on a, um, a portion of the loan at a lower rate, it really helps the cash flow numbers we're working for our work. When I'm running numbers, I'm seeing that more and more. So I'm looking for lending options where that's available. Yeah, definitely. That's we I mean there are some other products that are, you know, as far as like T1 buy downs and stuff like that, but um we're essentially getting money from the seller to buy down the rate <clears throat> specifically. But two, two one buy downs are great, but they don't last long enough. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Exactly <laughs> right. They're short, they're short. <laughs> Yeah, I got Thank a quick you. question, mm -hmm. um, if I can ask. Uh, we just finished a very long um, rehab of a property, and so it was standing vacant for several years. Uh, but uh, last couple months, we uh, rented out the final unit. So we have, it's a triplex, so we have all three units fully rented. But I'm, I'm wondering, because we have all our cash in it, and we need to, we need to, do a cash out refi uh we have no no mortgage right now on the property um when when is that rent seasoned enough uh outside of just us just having the leases which we already do um is there a time frame that we need to be thinking about where there's going to be an optimal amount of seasoning for that rent to help us in terms of qualifying and getting a, a good rate Yes, yeah, so you've owned the property for for a while. Yeah, we've owned it for three about three years now. Okay, so most likely what we're gonna have to do is go by go by your taxes um, for the property itself on how those are written. Come up with our calculation with that. <clears throat> um, let me uh, let me check and get back to you on that, but probably and see if there's any other way around it, but since you've owned it and it's been on your tax your tax returns, we're probably, probably going to have to just run with that, unfortunately, until you file taxes the next year and um, that gets offset and all that. So, so de facto, next year, once we've actually filed our 2024 return that includes that Schedule E rental income, that would be when that actually uh, benefits us in any uh, uh, in any way, uh, in terms of that cash out refi. 
Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends though. And I, I don't know what, if you, um, it depends on if you have other sources of income besides the, the rental properties and all that, if you do, then it might not matter. It might still be, might still work. That makes sense. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah, for sure. Someone was asking, I did see that, sorry, I missed this one. What's the difference between uh, banks and lenders or, and then brokers and lenders? Brokers and brokers and direct lenders are pretty much the same thing. Direct lenders is what, it, direct lender is what we are. Direct lender, we lend with our own money. So we have a warehouse line that we, that we pull off of and we fund loans with our own money. Um, so a broker, they don't fund with their own money. They are a true in between between XYZ investor, which, well, lender and the final end user. So then they're getting money. They have to borrow the money for it, the whole thing. So there's more hands, there are more hands in the pot a lot of times. Um, doesn't, it doesn't mean to say they're not good. There's still, I know some great brokers out there that it's, it's, they're not direct lenders, but brokers that do a great job. There's just more, there's more, um, more, more steps in the process, if you will. And more hands in it. Um, then banks, banks are going to, banks typically, especially when on investment properties, it's going to be harder. There's a big bank, I won't mention names right now that you all know, it's one of the bigger ones in the US that does not have an appetite at all for investment properties. So uh, that bank, they're, they're nationwide, they're, they're, um, they're sending stuff to me right now uh, on the investment portfolios like uh, their uh, financial advising side and some of their uh, bankers, mortgage people for investment properties. They just don't have an appetite for it. So whether you're doing like cash out refinance or if you're trying to pull a, heel, a home equity line of credit out on your investment property, which you can do um, or whatever, they're just, they don't have a huge appetite for it. So banks, a lot of times like a big box banks, they're just, they're not nearly as nimble. That's one of the big advantages of working with a direct lender is we are extremely nimble. That's all we do. We don't do car loans. We don't do um, credit cards. We don't do any of that other stuff. It's just loans. And we have, so we're kind of like a, we're a, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a specialized tool. But sometimes you will find banks have better rates right now. In this market, traditionally, we've always had better rates than big box banks. Right now, in some cases, they do just, they've got, if you're a direct lender, big banks are going to beat you. And it's just because they've, they've, uh, they can portfolio with it in-house and hold it in-house and they'll <clears throat> they'll take a bath on it and lose money to for the long-term gains on interest. I don't know if that if that helps or if you have on the, the difference between them, but that's gonna be your big biggest difference is we're just we're a lot more nimble, uh, like bank uh, brokers and direct lenders than big, the big box banks. They're not bad, just different. When you were talking about the mortgage broker and more hands being involved in the process, does that make it more expensive? Like, do they get a cut of something that makes it more expensive? It's a good question. It depends on the company, but it can. Sometimes you're still just as just as competitive with pricing as, as a direct lender is. It depends on their setup. <clears throat> the difference is they're going to have to like the difference. Is they don't have any in-house processing. They don't have any in-house underwriting. Whereas I can call underwriters and talk, talk with them directly. I can walk down the hall in our building and talk to an underwriter directly or my processors. I work with all, we work with all the same ones every time. Whereas a broker, they typically are not. They're, they're dealing with each individual. If they might work with 40 different, we say investors, we mean like, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Penny Mac, all a bunch of Mr. Cooper, all the different ones that we sell loans to. We underwrite all of our stuff for all of those. We don't have to go out to, whereas a broker has to have it underwritten by, by Mr. Cooper, by um, whoever, UMB Bank, by, they got to go separate. So it's, it's not as smooth, a seamless of a process is the biggest thing. But the, some of them are really good. And I know, you know, some of them are buddies of mine and some of them are just as competitive. So just a different model. Okay. Would it, um, do any of you guys have any other questions before I ask the next one? Uh, Dennis had a comment in there. 
Oh yeah. So let's see. <clears throat> yeah, you. Those are the big ones. Um, what your what your um, your fee is uh, for your you they'll call it processing. You can call it underwriting, a combination of. You can call it your origination fee, whatever. But a flat fee typically is going to be better. So like our flat fee is sixteen ninety five on investment properties and twelve ninety five on primary residences. Um, the other portion, but that all goes into the, the fee structure as far as what what rates they offer and points that are going to be points that are going to be offered for the you know for buying down the rate and all that. So it, it can vary a lot from lender to lender. I can tell you, sixteen sixteen hundred seventeen hundred dollars for origination is very is really competitive. I was doing back in twenty fifteen we were charging uh, sixteen ninety five for primary and for investment properties at another company I was at. I've been at two others for most of the time besides here. And the fees were always 1500 to 1800. So even the, so those are both good origination fees. In, in situ with Florida condos, we require We require a lot with condos, so I think, yeah, special assessments that are coming up and all that. It's there is more. We used to be able to get you. We used to have a short form and a long form with condos. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did a, did away with that. A short form basically elim, eliminates now like three things, so it really doesn't matter if it's short form or long. Condos are just getting harder to harder to lend on. Period. A lot of it has to do with a lot of the insurances are going up on a lot of them, you know, so their so their HOA fees will be going up or whatever, but the condos, they're not bad. They're just getting harder to lend on currently. It's been an issue for the past couple of years. It's getting increasingly harder. I have a, I have a question about uh, refinancing and buying down your rate. Mm -hmm. So what, what advice would you have for an investor who's, who can who can who wants to get into a deal and is planning maybe in years to come trying to refinance at if if interest rates go lower the deal pencils today but you're thinking if if rates come down in a few years you would um refinance at the lower rate versus um paying points to buy down the rate. Can you talk a little bit about when it makes sense to buy down the rate and how many years it would take to, to pay you back to do that, how it typically works? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it, it is exactly that. It all depends on what your goals are with the property, how long you plan on keeping them, what your rents mm -hmm. are, and all that. Um, <clears throat> it, and it depends on the, the price of the property too. So if it's a lower price property, a lot of times it can make sense to buy the rate down a little more because it doesn't cost nearly as much to buy it down. You know, to go from seven and a half to 7% is gonna cost you a lot less money. Uh -huh. uh, something that we, you know, we do to circumvent some of that is we do offer with, and I, I'm sure I've told you this, Frank, if I haven't, we, we do it for all of our returning clients. So, it's, but we do offer uh, zero to low cost refinance for returning clients after purchases and all that. So it's to help mitigate that so you can, depending on how quick the market moves. And if you do refinance, we can help lower your um, lower your recoup period. I think when you're looking at it, you wanna recoup your costs typically within, I try to stay between, <clears throat> for it to make sense, between 10 to 12 months typically. Um, if it's a downward market like we're in, what we're in right now, I think you, it's hard to say, to be honest, because you know two years ago, we were think we've been told this whole time by industry experts on the um, you know as far as rates are concerned that it was going to rates are going to go down in six months. Oh, it's another six months, just another six months. And it's been like that for going on three years now, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think we're seeing more people now that we're getting near the end. We're starting to see a little relief. Are starting to not buy points sometimes as much. But again, it depends on how what the price of the property is. If it's a low price property, it, it's going to make sense in a lot of cases. So it's a hard, hard to answer, I guess. And 
really what when it, where it comes down to is looking at all the numbers is it when we're sitting down and looking at your deal is going from there like based on your rents and what the loan amount is and how much it costs to buy the rate down so it's not just and you guys all probably know this already but to buy it down from seven percent to six percent or whatever the numbers are you're not buying it's buying just one point one point might only lower your rate by an eighth of a point or a quarter of a point it all depends on credit score, again, the size of the loan, your down payment, all that stuff. So I don't know that that really answered your question. It's really a case by case basis. Um, but it really, because the other part of it is, is you don't know it, if you were to be able to refi, you don't know how long that's going to be in the future and what rates you would get when you refi. So it's really hard to, to figure out if it's worth buying it down now. It is. No, totally. So what we'll do, if you really want to like look at that and dig into it, we do have some um, some ways to compare all those for you and send that over so you can look at a comparison between all of them. Mm -hmm. Did you did you tell Frank a while ago that you had a, a, a product where you had a, a no cost refi or something like that? Yeah, for return for returning clients, we'll a lot of that we do that a no cost refi. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of cost in it. But if we can do it, we try to do a very little or no cost for clients on a lot of cases. Yep. And then, oh, go on, I'm sorry. So, uh, so no, no cost means like no cost or like like no origination fee or what? <laughs> no. So I mean, no. When we can, we'll cover origination, title work, and appraisal. So I've got a couple people right now going through refinance. We're covering all that for them. Um, Sometimes there's just not enough room in it for us to do it or we can do that. But if at all possible, we, we always try and do that for everybody. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You no. Know, and then like one, one right now we're looking to do it. We're probably only going to be able to cover the origination, but it, you know, it's still, it's you know, 1695 on that. So. I hope that answered it. It's, it's a hard question to answer without going and really looking at the numbers and comparing it. Comparing them it's, back to back. It's like everything else in real estate. It depends on the numbers. Exactly right. So <laughs> that's right. So I was looking for like a general rule, like, oh yeah, you know, if you're gonna hold it for seven years, it usually works or something like that, you know. I got you. Yeah, I mean, the longer you're gonna hold it, the more sense it's gonna make to buy it down if you're not in a crazy rate environment like this. But it's just hard to say right now. I mean, this this has kind of thrown a lot of things out of the water, like out of the water on some general rule of thumb things like the general rule of thumb you'll hear is if, if you're not lowing at one percent, it's not worth it. That you can throw that out of the water because it, it, it depends on this again the size of the loan. It depends on how much you're what what matters to you if you're pulling cash out. If you're not, you know, some people fifty bucks makes a big difference. Others are not going to move for until they get say five hundred a month. So it, it all it all depends. But usually a refinance, even if there is cost, it's going to cost you a lot less than a purchase. So. I don't know if uh, if this makes sense or not, but I'm hearing you talk about doing HELOCs on investment properties, for example. Mm -hmm. it, is it something you can explain without too much trouble and use us as an example? Because we have we have the, the one property in St. Louis we purchased for seventy thousand and we paid cash. So if we wanted to borrow, say, fifty percent of that because 50% would buy us another house there. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? How does the HELOC work? Yeah, yeah, so it's, so it is just that it's a similar, like, a, well, it's really like a big credit card, but you're putting it against a house, right? So you're putting it, so it's a secured product that you're borrowing and pulling the equity, the equity out on. Um, different products have different lengths and terms on them, but Typically, you're going to see a term for your payments are going to be based off a 20 to 25 year amortization schedule. You have a draw period of anywhere from three years to 10 years where you can draw that money out and then pay it, pay it back off all the way. If you want, draw the money back out again, pay it back off. So just like a credit card, you can use it, pay it down. If you don't use any of it, the nice thing is you don't have a payment. Mm -hmm. If you open up that $50,000 line then you uh, and you don't find a house for a year, and you're still within your draw period, you can pull it out when you need it. Um, your, 
you know, once you get past the draw period, your payments are going to be fixed for the remaining term. So if it's a 20 year loan and you've got a five year draw period, your payments after five years, if you still have a balance, are going to be based off a 15 year amortization schedule. Does that answer what you're looking for? Yeah, that, that gives me some of the information. But like today, if we did that and we use some of it right away, what kind of interest rates are you looking at and that kind of thing? Yeah, and so interest rates are higher higher on those typically right now. You're going to be probably looking at 9 to 11% on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And would that be fixed at that rate or is that adjustable or? A little more fixed. So there's some products out there where you can fix it for the first, for the whole term. Like we have one that's, we can actually close it in five days. That's pretty nuts. The terms are, the rates are a little higher on them, but it's one of those products. If you need money really fast, most home equity lines of credit, they take 30 to 45 days to close out. You know, no matter what company you end up working with on it. There was one I used to send a lot of people to here in St. Louis that I don't anymore because they're, I don't know why, what they're doing over there anymore, but there's a few others that we work with. If we don't do it in house that typically they all take 30 to 45 days. But if you need cash really fast and you're doing it, we can close them and we can do one in about five to, five to seven business days or five to seven full days. Uh, rate's going to probably be, it's going to be between eight and 11%, but you can do it for, um, you can span your payments out over 30 years if you want on a 30 year amortization schedule. So it would have whatever rate you get when you open it, that would be fixed and yeah, so like if you did a $50,000 line, like one of them, we have to, have to pull it all out at one time. And then you can pay it back as quick as you want, but it's your fixed, let's say your rate's 9.5% on that. It's your, your, your rate is fixed at 9.5% on that 50,000 for the term you pick, whether it's 10, 20, 30 years, it's fixed. When you pay all that back off, let's say rates are at 7.5 at that time, they'll lock in again on, that, on what you drew out. So if you drew out 25,000 for a down payment, it'll be locked in on that 25,000 at seven and a half percent at that time. So, okay. so it just depends. There's a lot of different ways that people do it. They can be structured. Yeah. I, I have a question about that. And, and Frank, I'm, I'm glad you brought, brought this up because uh, I was literally in the process of um, like looking at HELOCs this week, at least just doing some research online, not really applying to anything yet. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is a question that I have to, um, I saw online that uh, there are some banks that actually offer repricing the actual rate, meet the actual fixed rate, meaning I could be at seven percent on a HELOC today, but in the future, if um, you know the interest rates are are a lower uh, number, I could pay like a hundred and fifty, three hundred bucks, and reprice that interest rate that I got at seven, and now I could be at a seven at a 5% interest rate in, instead, you know? So it's repri repricing the lock. And they allow you to do that like up to four or five times throughout the 10 years that you can do withdrawals. So I know about a bank that is actually allowing that or was allowing it about a year or two ago, which I think is very cool because, you know, not only you can have a fixed rate today on a HELOC, but also if interest rates go down, you can actually negotiate for the remaining of the withdrawal period on the HELOC, that rate to actually have it at a lower interest rate you know so i don't i was wondering is that something that you guys offer as well or will that be um, something that is not with what you guys normally we have some that float the whole time and some that'll lock right off the bat um the ones that are floating the whole time they'll float down as the market does does that make sense so if you've got if you've got twenty thousand pulled out on your line your rate mm -hmm. is moving the whole time you know, so if you're at, yeah, yeah. So I think what we're talking about when you when you mentioned that, I think we're talking about now variable rates, right? Like yeah, a variable rate. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is which is typically what you have in most uh, HELOCs. Right. But um, yeah, I just heard about this bank, and I, again, it might not be uh, something that is very common, but you know, and I don't even know if actually they still exist today. You know, it might not even be something that they're offering anymore. Mm -hmm. But I I know somebody that you know had this bank. Um, you know, they gave her a HELOC and she was able to um, negotiate or reprice that rate uh, throughout the 10 year. Like you can do it up to five times, you know, with yeah, this, so, with so this she bank, opened, you know. 
So she opened it up and it was locked in, you're saying? And then she Yeah, was yeah. A- yeah, it's a fixed rate. Yeah, he no, locked. And within 10 years, they allow you to reprice that interest rate five times. That's really good. I, I, we yeah. don't have one like that that I know about to check. We just picked up another one, but I don't, that sounds like a great program. I don't, yeah, if they still yeah. offer it, that's, yeah. that sounds like a pretty good win. Also, another thing that I wanted to mention is that I think HELOCs, they work completely different too, right? Than the other loans, like conventional loans, for example, in the sense of the banks actually can cancel the HELOC at any point in time. And I, I was watching some videos. Um, and when I mean cancel, I mean like, they cannot, they will no longer offer you the program anymore or the credit if you haven't used it. I was watching some videos yesterday of people that have been canceled recently as the economy changes. Banks uh, will, they could cancel your HELOC. So if you haven't used any of the, let's say that you're in year two, right, of your HELOC, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden the economy goes down, the bank can actually cancel that program with no pre notice. They will just send you a letter letting you know that your, you know, your HELOC is canceled as of X day. And then at that point, you you lose the opportunity, right, to use that capital. So one thing that I was watching on the video, actually from um, the Lumberjack, um, Matt the Lumberjack, that um, he actually lost his HELOC <laughs> and he didn't, he never withdraw any money on it. And, and that's one of the biggest things that he kind of regrets about because he lost the opportunity to use that capital. Like he was saying that it was actually for him better to probably just withdraw the money, even if he had, if he didn't have any deals available at that time, because at least at that point, that kind of guarantee that he had the capital on, on his end in case that the program was going to be canceled. So that's just something that I wanted to mention because I think it might be something that whoever gets a HELOC, right, might want to consider doing, um, just making the payments, even if you don't have a deal today, because that program could be canceled at any time, you know? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I'm sure that's certainly out there on those. I. I haven't experienced it for people that I know, but I'm sure that's, I, I believe you that, that they can definitely do that. Um, yeah, I heard they do that. They do that a lot, you know, in which cases when they see like, for example, a customer that have not been, because remember they don't, the bank are, the banks are not making any money until you're pulling any money out of that HELOC, right? So what happens is that some people sit on this money for years and they don't use it. And then at that point, some, some banks decide that, Hey, you know what? This money's, you know, we're not making any profit or any any money on this. And so let's cancel it, right? Yeah. So that's something that I've been reading about lately, you know. So I was just yeah, wondering. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So I think that, that kind of goes into like making sure you read and read the fine print on stuff and make sure, you know, that that's if that's something that they can do. Because there's definitely certainly with home equity lines of credit that's under a different umbrella than what we do on traditional loans and their rules are different. And especially if they're holding them in house, then they have a lot more leeway on what they can and can't do. So yeah, that's a really good point. You can, if you want to do them differently, you can do a he loan. It's just H E and then loan instead of he lock, he loan, you're pulling all the money out at once. And it's a second mortgage still on your property. You know, after your first, it's in second lien position, but it's you're taking all the money out at once and you make payments on it starting you know month two so yeah and and how how does the the terms look like on that one would that be like kind of the same interest rate and terms compared to heloc so it's going to be a fixed rate for the term on it yeah Mm gotcha rates can be a little better sometimes um and you were asking chester you're at chester's uh good on that yeah if you're if you're buying your rate down Part of it is you, you take we take it and you divide it out by how long it's going to take you to break you. So if it costs you a thousand bucks and it's saving you fifty a month, divide it by divide that thousand by fifty. But you can get into the weeds even further with that. There's more that goes into the interest side of it um, to really break that down. That you know, I've got some calculators that I can send you guys if you want to see that to help you make those decisions. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. I think um, Mark, the financial firefighter, had a comment in there. He looks like it's pretty right on describing how to how to figure out if buying down the rate is worth it. Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh, saying, would you just take the cost of buying down the rate and divide that by how much money you're saving per month, and that would give you how many months it would be before you, you break e- your break even point if you think you will hold longer than the break even, uh, it makes sense to buy it down. 
Yes. Yeah. That's that's the basis of it. Yeah. Is you're you're basically dividing out, and the difference in it is is interest in there, right? So you're finding out the difference in your interest um, and what your break even is by dividing that out. So yeah. That's and easy. if in a in a in a lowering interest rate environment, the longer you wait, the better rates you might get, right? So it's. <laughs> yeah. No, it is, and it's hard. <laughs> It's hard though, like to that note, it's funny talking to clients like the last refi boom, you know, I, we refinanced our house three times mm -hmm. because we didn't know what the bottom was. So which it's just picking that time when you know. So that's why if we can do it at no cost. It's a lot easier to, to recoup those fees. Um, but the, yeah, it's hard. We, you know, we had some people that I refinanced two clients two, three times. Then I had my sister-in-law that we, I was trying to lock her in at 2.75%. And she's like, oh, no, it's going to get lower. It's going to get lower. I was like, well, it could, but it's it starts with a two. We should be pretty excited about that. And she was coming from like four and an eighth. And uh, she kept holding on. And then it, they just kept creeping up. And we finally locked her at 3.25. So, yeah, it's it's hard. It's, uh, I guess, how, what's your, um, how, uh, how comfortable are you with risk? And uh, what, you know, how much do you need to save for it to make sense? Lee, Brian, I was wondering if you could kind of run a scenario of when it would make sense to do a refi. Like, say if maybe you're at it, because we talked about, you know, mortgage news daily, and that's a different rate from an investor rate. Yeah. And I was just kind of curious about how would you run that scenario? So like, for example, if it was like your rate was at seven, when would it make sense to kind of reach out to you, say, hey, could we kind of look into a refi, see if it makes sense? Yeah. Yes. I, I can kind of work that up and send it out to you guys so, and you can, you can uh, spread it around. It's um, typically we like to have conversations with clients when we're getting within a quarter point of where that rate needs to be um, for their monthly savings to make sense. Um, and that way with this, like the last two and a half, three years, when rates are going down a little bit and jerking back up, going down a little bit and jerking back up, if we have your your file built and ready to go, we can pull that trigger right away when we know where that 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 pull point is. But it's um, I'll work up some scenarios for you. I, biggest thing is like figuring out what you think you need to say, you know, what you're comfortable with saving on a monthly basis, because everybody's financial decision is going to be different. And it matters if you're going to pull cash out, if you're not pulling cash. Um, you know, sometimes if you're if you're on hard times, I've had clients where they they just fell on hard times. One of the people, um, unfortunately, one they lost their job, and we had uh, we did a refinance. It only saved them. It was fifty bucks a month, but for them, that's all they needed. Plus, they had two months without a mortgage payment. That was that was what they needed to keep them afloat for them not to start, you know, losing their house or falling back and getting their car repoed and stuff like that. So it's it's hard to Ooh, say. that's pushing it close. <laughs> <laughs> they really, it really they, were on the, they were on the last end of it. I was, it took a few months before it, of them trying other stuff and us talking before they decided they pulled the, you know, I didn't want them to do it. It wasn't, it was cutting really close, but it, um, for theirs, it saved them their neck and they were able to save the house and they got, husband got a job again. And so it's, uh, it's really just having that conversation and finding out where, where it's going to make sense um, for each individual property. What, how much you need to save monthly, what your recoupment period is. We like to stay around, you know, really they say a rule of thumb is if it's two years or less for your recoup on the cost of the refinance, it's you're starting to get there. But 10 months is, I think, is a good number when you're really looking at it. 10 to 12 months um, for you to recoup your cost. But I can work up some different scenarios if you'd like. Well, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, I hope, hope that answered it. Um, a little bit but yeah yeah um i have a question so like in the case that like when i'm applying for a conventional loan right mm -hmm. um if uh, if i'm if i'm the only one in the in the actual mortgage right and and i'm married like can my wife also apply to a loan at the same time while i'm going through my loan process uh yeah yeah some of it depends so on will that be an issue because she's going to be untitled on the title on the property bought, she's not going to be in the actual mortgage. It depends on, on like your financials and what states you're in on if you're in a marital state or not. Um, there's a few different things that go into it. Like you're in California, if you're buying a house in California, 
we have to we have to pull both your both your credits on it. Even if only one of you one of you is going on it, we have to pull credit for both of you and hit both liabilities against you. So it's a little different in, in Missouri. If I keep the wife off of the loan or the husband off the loan or whoever, we only count who's going on the loan. Um, gotcha. Yeah, I'm in Florida, Florida State. Florida, okay, yeah. So it just depends on it depends on the state if it's a marital state or not, and it also depends on your your personal finances and. If you guys can support, you could buy three properties at once if you guys identified them and everything was good financially. Gosh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we wore them out. I think so. I <laughs> <laughs> There's, we, um, well, if, yeah, I don't know if, if you ever want to. We do we do uh, investor meetups here. They're more, a lot of them in person. We're figuring out how to get at Zoom and in person to work right, <laughs> to work right. But um, we do uh, teach classes on that too. And Greg actually does continuing education classes around. I'm waiting on the list to get on that. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd be happy to, I got a little bit of homework, I think tonight on, maybe some scenarios on why it might make sense to refinance and win. And then um, there's a couple others I've got some notes on. Yeah, we'd appreciate that. And I can get um, whatever documents you were gonna send to me, we can spread them around mm -hmm. amongst ourselves. And um, yeah, I think so sometimes it's a little difficult, like you said, because it's, uh, everything's moving and flowing week to week and everybody's situations is a little bit different, but I think we got a lot of great information uh, about the process in general. I, I hope so. It's got, it's a hard, kind of not the most exciting one to go over. I hope it was helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm sure it was. Um, before we and the call, do you guys have any other questions or what's going on with you this week? I just put a question on the chat, Frank. Yeah. One last question about the HELOC, because I know mainly HELOCs are for primary residents, but I know that nowadays there are some HELOC products for investment properties too. So my, my question was, oh, yeah. if, um, if, the, if this is something that they are offering as well, you know, like for investment properties. Yeah, yeah. he was just talking about that. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, okay. no, you, you can do HELOCs on investment properties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, good question. Because you're right, there's there's not a lot of companies that can, but you know, we can and we know some others as well that if it's not and not in our arena that we can we can get, introduce you to. That's good news. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then that's... uh Brian, following up on that, is that something where for HELOCs on investment properties, does there have to be like a specific uh, amount of equity in the property or does the property have to be like a certain uh, amount um, thinking about where you'd mentioned you can uh, loan on properties down, I think as low as 40 K um, does there have to be like certain thresholds or limits or things like that? Yeah. Uh, and it, some of it depends on your credit on the credit score on what loan to value we can go to <clears throat> um, minimum taken out typically is going to be 25,000. Um, sometimes it's more. And then there's a mat, there can be a max on it too, but a lot of it's driven on, on what your credit score is and, you know, on what loan to value you can go up to. Typically you're going to be capped at on a HELOC on an investment property though it's 70% combined loan to value. Okay. That makes sense. And it looks like Sean also asks, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like this would make sense. Uh, Sean is asking for a HELOC. Do we have to get an appraisal? Some companies, yes, and some, no. And that's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, so yes and no. So we have a product where it's it's the one that's really fast. We, we can get them closed in five days. Usually it's seven, but we can do them in five. But it's it's fast. It's a little more, exp on the, a little more expensive than if you go through a, you know, a, a smaller, like, uh, community credit union on it, but if you need it quick, then um, then that one it can be done fast. But like that one doesn't need an appraisal. Um, some do and some don't. And then as far as the terms go, the typically is going to be a little more expensive on an investment property than your primary, and that's just because 
And that's why investment properties are more expensive in general period to, to finance and purchase and all that. Because if something were to happen, if you're looking at it from the lending side, if something were to happen and you have a primary residence and you have an investment property or several, if something happens and, you know, God forbid you lose your job or your income, which one are you going to keep making payments on? You're going right. to... You're going to keep making them on your primary residence, not your not your investments. So that's why the terms and rates are always higher on investment properties. Is that's one of the big things with it. Also has to do with some things Fannie and Freddie did in the last couple of years that we won't go into. But it's called loan level pricing adjustments. If you want to bore yourself at night and fall asleep, LLPA. <laughs> that's another reason investment properties are more expensive. They made it more expensive in the last two and a half years. So. Okay, makes sense. But yeah, you know, covering the, uh, covering the for the risk. Uh, looks like. Oh, okay, yeah, and I see. Yeah, that's where Basilio was asking that question. Yeah, about the terms for the, uh, primary and investment. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, and I do. I know I'd mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I know I do owe you, a follow up as well with uh, the turnkey provider haven't heard back from him yet. So I am guessing it's is uh, they and the appraiser are probably kind of going back and forth. I think you called it like the reassessment of, of value. Was that it or? Yeah. So, yes. Appraisals were reconsideration of value. Yeah. So it's got to go through, through a, a certain process. They're pretty fickle about how it's done. So yeah, if he's doing that right now with them, it's, um, but no, take brother, take take your time, brother. I, we know we're not in a rush on it. You know, it's it's got to make sense for you. And if it doesn't fall on the numbers that you need it to, then then um, where I get it, we just okay. want to yeah. make sure it's the right deal for you. And if it is, well, we'll finish it out. If not, then uh, yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Definitely makes sense. And like I said, I'm starting the process of exploring but nothing identified yet as far as like um you know potential duplexes possibly triplexes but more so right now focusing on uh duplexes once this one closes nice yeah that's great there so if, if you guys don't know you probably do <clears throat> uh, single families you can put down as little as 15 percent on an investment property you get smoked on the terms by Fannie and freddie but you can do it it's usually not advised by how many points you have to pay and everything else, but you can do it if push comes to shove. Two family and above, you have to put 25% down. Makes sense. Okay. Definitely learned something new right there also too, but I just figured everything was just start at 25% and go from there. So, okay. It's a lot of times it makes the most sense, but it just depends on the scenarios again. And then that, then that answer suck. It depends on the, it depends on the, Everybody's scenario. <laughs> Not the most funny. Yeah. yeah. Now, would it ever make sense? Like, I know some people, like, uh, I don't want to use the phrase cash strap, but, like, that's the only thing I can think of as, like, one extreme, but then cash flush, I guess, is the other as far as, uh, you know, where the numbers would work on various investment properties. Um would there ever be a time where it may make sense to go slightly above and then do uh, like a 70, 30 loan to value, meaning they would, you know, the investor would come with 30% down versus just 25. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it, it does. It, some of that depends on, you know, how much cash they have and they want set aside for purchasing other properties and all that or want reserves, but <clears throat> sometimes it does make a, a, pretty good difference and in, in the terms of the loan as far as the rate goes and all that but it is uh, it is always situ situational so we can definitely explore that and sometimes we i do have uh, one client right now they're putting down they're putting down instead of 25 they're doing not 15 percent but 20 on a property because that's going to leave them with enough cash even though the rate's going to be quite a bit higher it's going to leave them with enough cash to buy another property and their plan is then to refinance down to a lower rate when that comes down but they want to acquire more currently so okay and then that oh, oh i apologize i might have been i don't know if you had uh, um had uh answered this one um uh refi loan period or um trying to think 
uh, what is the, uh, I guess, minimum amount of time that would be necessary to, like, if somebody were to get a property at, like, you know, some crazy, like, 9 or 10%, and then rates drop, uh, you know, the Fed funds rate and all that drops, and they could refi into a property for, like, 6%. What like time frame would there have to be? Is it like six months, three months, a year? How long would would they have to wait? There's really not. Um, you can do it pretty quick. It again just depends on what how much of a drop is going to make sense for you financially. You know, for for monthly savings. Um, <clears throat> if it's a if it's like if you're buying a probably like a four family unit and you're moving into one of the built one of the properties as your primary. And you got three other rentals on that scenario, you have to wait six months and or two or six payments and or 210 days from closing to closing. And that's a government rule on Fannie Mae, on, on FHA, any USDA loan, VA loans. If you're buying a, a multi-unit with a VA loan or FHA, you would have to wait 210 days and or six months, six payments. Mm, okay. So on that side of that, there's really not. I'll go... There's there's more to that answer that I can answer. Well, it's going to be boring, but so I won't. I don't want to take up all the time with it. But it's conventional. There really isn't a waiting period. Gotcha. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Definitely appreciate it, Brian. Yeah. No, thank you guys again. Again, I know this can be somewhat dry, but it's you know I enjoy I enjoy coming on here and appreciate you guys asking questions. Yeah. Where it sounds like. Um... It's good just to be ready. I think, um, you know, uh, I think it was Troy who's in Kansas City. Hopefully they'll be reaching out to you. But just to to get your file started and get all your information in there uh, and try to be as ready as possible in case a deal does come your way would, is where we are trying to be also. Um, but with all the different, um, like, HELOCs on investment properties and just um, like Chester was just saying, uh, a few of us were hoping that interest rates would stay a little bit higher so that, you know, we might have an opportunity in the next year or two to refi if they dropped. Yeah. So, it, you know, just to be ready for different scenarios, I think would be helpful. And then you just have to do a little updating when the time's right or, or when the time comes. So. Yeah, I think that's the biggest takeaway from all this is it just be, if you have questions or if you're concerned about anything or want to make sure that your long-term goals are you're going to be able to hit them the, the sooner we have a conversation or if you the sooner you have a conversation with your lender the better so you can get ready for those and plan for them um so that way you can't strike while the iron's hot exactly right yeah great i think um we'll probably close it pretty quick here but just and you know you're we would love it if you join us anytime in the future but next week we're supposed to have one of the uh Dana from Hemlane, one of her associates is going to be on with us next week talking about Hemlane property management and, nice. and things like that. So um, that's what's coming up. And then the week after that, I think I'm hoping one of my property managers from St. Joseph there um, will be coming on with us the week after. So um, trying to bring in some people that have helped us along our journey um, and it really helps, you know, knowing that you, as far as our experience goes, you haven't seemed to mind explaining things in detail to us because, you know, uh, now we know a lot of the stuff and we won't have to bother you again with the questions, but for, for those of us who don't know, um, you know, you've been very patient in explaining how it all works. So that's more valuable than anything. Well, I appreciate it. I, the more you know, the easier it is. And I, you're in good company. I ask a lot of questions. I actually got in trouble in school for it in high school. I got called uh, to the principal's office, and my parents had to come in because I asked too many questions. So you never, you never, you're never bothering me with questions. <laughs> Great. All right, cool. If not, if nobody else has any other questions, then um... I think this is going to be the shortest one yet. Hour fifty three. That that's a record in the wrong direction, but <laughs> no, it means we're getting efficient. It means we're efficient. <laughs>
you gotta have more exciting people out here besides me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I see Matesh, you just dropped in. It's the first time I've seen you here. Did you have any questions before we end the meeting tonight? Um, no, no, I re I joined about a month ago too on one of the other ones. Oh, good, okay. But so I don't have any questions. Okay, okay, well, thanks for coming back and we'll be back next week. And of course, um, the East Coast Accountability Group um, is hap happens on Sundays at 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. Eastern. So if you guys uh, wanna ever jump in on there, that's been a good one for the last couple of weeks as well. So we'll, we'll stop awesome. it there. Thank you again, Brian, for your time and thank all you. the great, great information. Yeah, no, thank yeah. you. I'd love to come back and visit and be a fly on the wall. I, uh, yeah. I like the last time I learned just as much, if not more from you guys. Um, so I appreciate all the info. Yeah. And I think, you know, usually, well, like you saw the last time, Hey, Sean, thank you. Um, we'll be updating people on what's going on with us. I know, you know, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about struggling with having a few vacant units and trying to get tenants placed and buying these new ones. And we're going to have even more units to, to fill, but, um, we got, uh, so we got some good news and bad news this week. We're going to go through an eviction in, um, our duplex in Milwaukee and but we did get one of the units the new renovated units filled in our St. Joseph triplex so that that's been a long time coming so uh, and I, I you know people seem interested in the St. Louis market because of what they've been exposed to here and so we're anxious to see how long it's going to take us to fill our two new units and what the rents are going to be just so people can have more up-to-date information on that stuff. Well, yeah, definitely let us know how that goes, uh, Frank. That's, you know, could okay. potentially be, uh, I don't want to say scary, uh, but it could be potentially uh, nerve-wracking. It is. Yeah, it, it has been nerve-wracking. But luckily, we're, uh, like we always talk about having reserves and stuff, we have plenty of reserves. So we're not rushing, you know, trying to just fill the units with anybody. So hopefully that'll that'll play out well. And we'll and we'll look forward to hearing your update too on the turnkey as well. Yeah, yeah. If as long as there is one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Appreciate it.